So um, I think we're live on air with this uh, Google Hangout for the Cardiff University MOOC on Community Journalism. I'm Professor Richard Sandbrook, uh, and I'm delighted that we're joined this week by my colleague here at Cardiff, Glyn Mottershead, who has uh, been narrating the uh, videos about setting up your WordPress blog. Hi, Glyn. Hi. Uh, and uh, even more delighted, we're joined by uh, a friend and former colleague of mine, Dave Brewer, who is a, a BBC and CNN online pioneer, I think I could call you. Dave, and now a media strategy consultant who spends your time flying all over the world helping independent media set up and establish themselves and, and succeed. So you've a huge amount of experience, but we're very lucky that, to find you at home today and not on an aeroplane. So thank you very much for giving up your time to join us. And you've been busy in the, uh, in the Future Learn Forum as well, answering some questions too. So that's, that's been great. So um, we've got two themes for this uh, final Hangout. We're now in the final week of the course. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about technical issues to give some support to people who've been been asking for that, uh, and in particular for Dave to talk uh, uh, from his experience about community media and independent media in uh, other parts of the world outside of Europe and, and North America in particular, um, uh, and particularly perhaps thinking about business models and so on as well, because that's something he's got experience of that a lot of people have been asking questions about. Uh, and just a reminder that um, you can ask questions if you're tuning in. Um, either on Twitter with the hashtag FL Community Journal, or on the Future Learn page on week five under the Ask the Educators uh, section. There are already some questions there. Or if you're tuned in through Google Plus, as I assume you must be, uh, there's a space to ask questions uh, live, as it were, in the Google Plus area as well. So um, I wonder, uh, Dave, can I start with you? Because we have a number of questions coming from um, participants in Africa, particularly, and parts of Asia. This course has focused very much on digital opportunities and online and, and setting up blog sites and so on. But what if you live in an area of the world where there's very poor or no internet, but you still want to engage a community and engage in some community journalism or community media? What are some of the examples that, that you've seen or some of the ideas that you can offer for people who may live in a more uh, remote or developing part of the world where the digital opportunities aren't there? I think it's surprising how many digital opportunities do exist and how fast the uh, spread of connectivity is across Africa. Um, faster than I thought and with a take up particularly on uh, social media and Facebook that I hadn't expected. Um, take for example AMH in Zimbabwe Alpha Media Holdings and they run three newspapers, Newsday which is a daily, they run the Standard which is a Sunday political newspaper and they run the Zimbabwe Independent which is a financial weekly. They do a lot of their news gathering with mobile. Mobile is well spread across Zimbabwe and you can get to places like Bulawayo and you can get stories in where they've got an office but in some of the remote regions you get people texting in their stories which are then followed up by the journalists and, and we apply the same um, rules. They have to get two independent sources. They have to be verified, checked, tested, make sure the facts are, are, are sound. And then they're put into the newspaper and then they're put online at the same time in a sort of converged newsroom. But increasingly, they're using Facebook to do their interviews. So for remote areas, and this surprised me, but it's, it's growing every time I go down there. They have uh, interviews carried out with uh, district officials or with members of the public in the community talking about things that are going on in Facebook. They use Facebook for news gathering. They use all these tools for doing their main news gathering. So I would think that the answer to the question really is that let's not underestimate how fast the internet is spreading. The connectivity rates are um, are increasing. People are using mobile, but also the uh, ability for people to um, connect with the journalists is much greater than it was a few years ago. Now we've had a number of people, Dave, who've been talking about community radio, which is um, very important in some parts of the world, and again, something we haven't really covered very much, uh, if at all, on this course. Other examples you've seen of of uh, community radio and how easy is it to set up a a small local station from scratch because obviously it feels as if there's a lot of technology involved. So, uh, any examples of community radio? Well, there are a lot of tools to allow you to become a broadcaster from the desk you're sitting in. Uh, so, I think everyone probably knows about SoundCloud where you can upload uh, and create radio uh, from uh, an ordinary computer. I was working in Jaffna in Sri Lanka last year, or maybe it was the year before. Yes, it was probably in November of the year before. And I was working with the MRTC, which is the Media and Resource Training Center in Jaffna. 
and the students there decided they want to build community radio. Uh, we did a training course. I used the old BBC model of a news and current affairs program like the Today and took uh, the first half an hour, which included um, uh, a set piece interview, a vox pop, and a package. A package being my voice around three different clips. And we put a news bulletin on the top and a weather forecast at the end. And they went out with little Zoom mics and they went into the tsunami devastated areas of J Jaffna. They went out to see the people who'd um, survived the war and they brought back some fantastic footage, all in Tamil. And they edited it with free editing tools on their computer called Audacity. They uploaded it to SoundCloud, which is free. They tagged it well with the um, name of the program and they put out this program called MRTC Newsround. It went out in um, Tamil, it was picked up by the BBC World Service Tamil service and they contacted them to ask could they use some of the material. So suddenly here you had some people in a really, really remote part um, who, who had a tough time, who took simple tools, went out, gathered content and created a community news bulletin which they then used social media, all free. This is all free, it doesn't cost a penny. And by using the tagging, by using the hashtags, by making sure that their headline was a sentence that made sense and stood alone, that the summary added content, added value, added context, and they put all that out and they got followed and found. That to me is a great story of how it can be done. And I think it gives hope to anyone, you don't need any training. I mean, you and I, you know, your, your business is based on training journalists to be professional, but actually anyone who has a passion for an issue or a story who actually can go out and find something that had it not been for them, the world would never have known. And they can put that in sound or audio or video. We've got journalism. And the fact is that free tools mean that community radio can come from anywhere now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a great example. Um, Glenn, can we can we turn to you now? And um, obviously, you've you've done the videos on setting up WordPress sites and so on to, to help people go that extra step. Um, we we flag them as optional because they are you know technical and perhaps not everybody wanted to engage with them. Um, but we've had some feedback. Uh, I think I got something wrong in the last hangout last week. So let's get it absolutely right this week. Can you just briefly talk us through the differences between WordPress.com and .org? What the advantages are? And we've had a couple of questions of people saying they, they, they have been unable to download WordPress, although WordPress strictly isn't something you download. So could you just talk, talk about those two issues a little bit? Yeah, sure. We'll stick with, start with the first one. WordPress.com is a site where you just log on, create an account, and they will give you your own blog. You can actually, once you've got a, an account, you can sign up for multiple blogs. The thing about it is that they're looked after completely by WordPress. There's no technical expertise required whatsoever. So I, I often recommend that as a starting point for people. If they're more bothered about the community and getting the content out there, with the minimum of technical hassle, that's a great place to start. Think about WordPress.org or self-hosted WordPress, as it's also known. That's where you have to actually either install yourself as we were doing through the uh, through the video, we test set that up on a test server. Or if you rent server space, quite often they'll have it actually available as a one-click install for you. The difference between the two is the power. And there's a lot of big media groups, a lot of hyperlocals use the full version because you can change it and you can adapt it to do things for yourself. The advantage of it is you just pay for the name and you, your web domain name and your web server. You don't pay anything else. It's your time then to alter any files, add plugins, whatever you want. WordPress.com is free to a point. If you want to put your own web address on there, you pay WordPress. If you want to have extra storage space, you pay WordPress. If you want to host videos and audio on there, you pay WordPress. Now again, we were talking about SoundCloud a minute ago. You don't actually have to upload video or audio to WordPress.com. So that's one place you don't have to pay money. You put it on YouTube, you put it on SoundCloud, and that way you can just embed it. So there's a piece of code on both of those sites for whatever video or audio, and you just take it across and upload it. I think the, the key thing, some people get in a little bit concerned about the technicality of it. Fine, don't start with the self-hosted WordPress. Start with WordPress.com. Have a play with it. Get used to how it is. Make sure that you are concentrating exactly rightly on your headlines, on your content. Make sure you're writing 
good stuff that the people in your community are interested in and want to read. And then later, should you want the extra power, there's a really simple export function. With a click of a couple of buttons, all of your site can be downloaded to your computer and then re-uploaded to a new site, should you wish. So I think, you know, we were trying to show people some of the possibilities. Yeah. I think you don't, don't worry about it. My advice, if you're new, if you're sort of phased by technology, sign up at WordPress.com, get a free account, do not pay anything, and just get to, get to see what you need for your community. Great. Okay, so keep it, keep it simple and, and as you go along. Well, we talked a lot about WordPress um, uh, for reasons that we explained at the time because it's you know very widely used and has a lot of functionality and, and other advantages. Are there other platforms that people might consider? People use Blogspot. Um, I'm not personally a fan. It's a good tool, but the way I work and the kind of the ability to extend it, I'm not as big a fan. Facebook. Facebook is great for some people. Um, Twitter, obviously, for it depends where you are in the world, though. Yeah. You know, every different parts of the world will have different social media outlets that are prevalent for them. This is what we were saying sort of a couple of weeks ago. Look at your communities. Work out what kind of tools people use. I mean, I talk a lot about tools in my kind of work. It's only because it's like newspapers. If you've got a news agent on a street corner, it's easy for people to get hold of the information that you're trying to share. So again, Twitter, Facebook, blogging software. Have you, you know, Drupal mm. is another free web software. It's really complicated. It's far more complicated than WordPress. Great. It's a really good tool. So it is kind of start with what you want to do. Okay. Work out what you're trying to do. Don't overdo it. And build up from there. Have one place where you feel comfortable and then start to explore what other opportunities there are. Great. Dave, do you have any other thoughts on, on kind of platforms people should think about using, perhaps? Or, you know, yeah, I, th I think that uh, Glenn's, Glenn's covered it. Um, I use Joomla for my main site. I use WordPress for my blog. I use WordPress for another of my sites, um, WordPress.org. Uh, and, yeah, I think one of the confusions and maybe one of the questions being asked earlier on today was maybe someone's tried to download WordPress to their computer. And Glenn made the point, you need to have a host. You, know, you need to have someone to host it for you so they can serve your site, meaning that when people come to click on a page, it's the host that sends the page to them. And now if you download WordPress to your computer, you're not going to get very far unless that computer is a server pushing it out to the world. Yeah, so, I mean, what the reason some people were trying to do that is one of the sessions was setting up a local test server just so people could play with it in safety and just get used to some of the things. Oh, I see. But, you know, if you download it to your own computer, there's not much use in that. Yeah. Okay. No, not that test. In answer to your question, Richard, one, one more bit of advice is everybody these days is a global brand. They're a global broadcaster or publisher, anyone, in anyone's back bedroom. And it's important to think of what that brand is, what your message is, who your audience is, what your ed editorial values are. And, and so people can trust you, you have some sort of integrity. And when you design that brand, you think of your logo, your little avatar, you think of your um, username. So I use Helping Media on Twitter, I use Helping Media on Storyfy, on YouTube, on everything. You carry that brand through to every social media platform, you carry it through to your blog, you carry it through the same little picture. So you are building a global brand. The person in the most remote part of the world who has connection to a telephone socket to connect to the internet is their own global brand. And it, it, we think like this, all these tools start to make sense. If you think differently, the tools start to become fragmented, confusing, and start to push you in the direction of playing with tools rather than doing your job. Your job is as an individual journalist or a citizen journalist or a community news gatherer, I don't care what it is, your job is to find those facts that had it not been for you, nobody would know about. And then you source them, you verify them, you test them with your editorial standards of objectivity, fairness, impartiality, and you put out a brand uh, clean, piece of content, whether it's audio, video, or whether it's text. And I think that's the important thing, is branding for the individual. And once we've got that, I think you've really got down the road of having someone working in the community producing some really good content. Great, thanks. Now, we've had a couple of questions in on uh, Google Plus on the sidebar, so let's try and deal with those while we've got them. 
Uh, Mark Gerasalmi, I'm sorry if I've pronounced that wrongly, is asking whether we're going to... Um, oh, something's happened to my... I think I've dropped out. I can still see you. Can you? No, well, I'll carry on then. Uh, he asked whether um, we're going to have statements of completion at the end of this course. Um, the answer, I'm afraid, is, is no on, uh, at this time. Um, but uh, we might consider that in future um, uh, because this will, will stay up there for, uh, for some time. Um, hang on a second, I'm just trying to get back into the call. There we are, and I think I'm back. Uh, so no, no statement of participation this time around. The content's going to stay up there, open-ended as it were, but we will sort of formally rerun the course in the future and we will think about uh, whether we do statements of participation uh, another time round. Um, Amanda Venning has asked uh, two questions here. One is where do we go from here looking for other support online for developing as a journalist. Um, I'm going to offer some thoughts at the end, Amanda. There will be some, some links available both through the FutureLearn uh, course and also on the communityjournalism.co.uk site for the Centre for Community Journalism here in Cardiff University. So we will offer you some, some links to kind of be able to take things hopefully a stage further if you want. You also asked, Amanda, about the merits of hyperlocal journalists joining the Press Association. Now, the Press Association is a news agency which sells news to news organizations. So uh, I don't think you want to join it because presumably you don't want to subscribe to the Press Association. It would cost a lot of money. Maybe you want to sell your news to them. That's kind of you know up to them, and, and, and uh, they may be interested, they may not. But I wonder whether actually you're thinking about the union and the National Union of Journalists and whether there's a point in community journalists trying to become accredited through union membership and so on. And Glyn, I don't know whether you have a view about uh, NUJ in the UK, obviously there are different unions in different parts of the world, whether there's an advantage for hyper-local and community journalists working with, with, with uh, journalism unions, journalist unions in order to try and um, network but also to, uh, to get some, some accreditation. I think it's a, it's a difficult question to be honest. Um, partly because it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're if you're kind of just telling people about some of the news news that's happening in your community, do you need that kind of union support? If you're doing some of the more sort of controversial stuff, if you are interested in sort of looking in depth at what your local authorities are up to and really kind of pushing that kind of investigation as you learn the skills required to do it, then yes, it's probably a good idea because one of the things of most unions is support, advice, and should should people need it, legal support. So I think, you know, I'd say it's very much up to the individual. There are advantages to it, um, but as with anything else, you know, as a, as a union, there'll be cost implications. Yeah. Um, I and think, you know, it comes back to what we were saying right from the word go. Sort out what you're trying to do first. Work out what your site's about, uh, you know, brand is exactly the right word and then you can see what you require from there. So I'm not opposed to it. I think people should really investigate it. I just don't think everybody needs it. Okay, now we have a, a couple of questions here asking how we can um, hyperlocal sites or community sites can attract advertising, which leads into obviously the question of business models and how you make it sustainable. Um, David, I don't know whether you've had experience of that, of trying to make things either commercially successful through online advertising or other, other business models that people might want to consider. Yes, we can talk about that. Going back to that last question, maybe the person that posed it was um, uh, was trying to find out how to make some money from their journalism. And um, there is a site called Storyful where you can sign up and you can send in your content and um, they will check it and verify it. And, if, and then they'll sell it on to the big boys. And you know, there's a chance that your stuff will get on to... Uh, some of the, the the big global broadcasters and online on, on websites, and then you get a cut. So if you want to just go and have a look at Storyful and sign up and start filing some of your best stories, you might be in the money if you do it that way. So okay. that's one way. Um, going back to uh, sustainability, you know, it, it's very important, in um, particularly in the developing world, that uh, media is uh, financially independent, because unless you're financially independent, it's very difficult to be editorially independent. And if you're funded by donors from the West, there's also suspicion about your um, focus and why you're there and so on. So all around the world, media is trying to find that mystery of how to make money. And of course, the first thing to do is to have no extra costs. So you go as thin as you, uh, you go as lean as you can be to start, and you are realistic. 
So um, there, there are only really three or four ways of making money. You can have um, subscription, so you can charge people. So one example of that is Malaysia Kinney in Kuala Lumpur, who I helped about um, eight years ago when the government of Mohammed Mahathir didn't like independent media. But they got through a loophole and they put a magazine out called Malaysia Kinney. And they, anyone in the area was forbidden from advertising with them because to advertise with them would get um, frowned upon by the government. So they had a real struggle. And at first they were donor funded, but they realized they had to become financially independent in their own right. So they built a business model based on um, three subscription models, which was um, you could pay a very small amount just to get the, the, the main story. You could pay a bit more to access the archives and so on. And um, that made money. And then finally, the climate change, and they were able to have advertising, and now they're in the black. And the other way of doing it, of course, is to have sponsorship. And you sponsor sections of your website if you're a small media house. That doesn't really work for a a small community site maybe um, and of course you can run adverts now anyone can put um, Google AdSense on their site and start to make money and even if you have a small WordPress blog you can stick in a, a widget it's called and Glyn will explain this in detail, detail I'm sure at another time but you just have this ad unit and you start to get money every time it's viewed or clicked and there's different levels of income that come in and it's context related and it's also geo focused so if someone looks at my site from Nigeria they'll see ads that are fit for a Nigerian and so forth um, now this starts to bring in a bit of money so I've got a little community website I set up when I was building BBC News online with Richard and the team way back in 1997 and I tried some of the ideas from my village that we were running on BBC and that little website has a community forum it gets 3.3 million page impressions a year it's only got about 3,000 people in the village it's a small little leafy place but we've got Google AdSense on there and that pays all the costs and that just serves the ads. I don't have to worry. I don't have to talk to any advertisers. I don't have to do anything. I just stick my PayPal account in and the money comes rolling in. Now, I would recommend anyone that wants to start up a small media operation to use Google AdSense because in the first instance, it will give you detailed statistics of your user base, where they're coming from, what they clicked on, what they left, what they didn't like, what they liked. Over three months, you can start to fashion your editorial proposition to be far more focused based on that detail. Now, once you've got that detail, you can make a decision six months down the line, ditch Google, but, um, hire a local sales ad sales guy and get him or her to go and knock on doors in the local community and sell ads. Now, you can't sell ads unless you've got a proposition that the advertisers want to buy. Google AdSense will give you that. So you can use Google AdSense and then move on from it. So anyone can start to make money. It's, it's actually quite amazing. And once people start clicking on your content and clicking on the context-relevant advertisements that are going next to it, um, it's a lovely feeling. And this is what's being used by a lot of exile media. I work with exile media. They're not going to get anyone supporting them with adverts because it's just politically not going to happen in the short term. However, the exile media I'm working with, they're going to be mainstream media tomorrow. The, the, the speed of political change around the media is so fast that they have to prepare for that. And Google AdSense gives them that amazing preparation to start to build up a sales and marketing department. It could be based around one person. You've got all the data in one place. Great, thanks, Dave. That's really, really helpful. So ha have a look, have a look at uh, Google Google AdSense, and I think Amazon do a, a similar kind of uh, uh, system as well. If uh, I can just pile in on the end of that as well, there are a number of services. There's a one that's based in the UK, but does have a sort of global reach. Um, there's tools like Adiply which is exactly that second kind of model you're saying about once you've actually built the page impressions, once you've got something to show to advertisers. Um, there's part auction house, so people can actually bid to sort of advertise on your site. You can have somebody sell that on your behalf. So there's kind of, people are actually recognizing that people want solutions to that kind of problem. How do we get beyond the kind of Google Ads model once we know what we're doing. Um, so, it, you know, it's well worth having a look for those as well. The crucial thing, of course, is to build an audience. So that's understanding what people want to read, providing them with things that will make them come to your site and click on your site and so on, and then, you know, these uh, these services can start to, to bring, hopefully, a bit of money in enough to, to at least cover your costs. Let me pick up a few other um, questions that are, are coming in here. Um, Moses has asked a couple of questions. He says, can we further this course with Cardiff University on community journalism, 
uh, it depends what you mean, Moses. The university runs a lot of full-time you know, courses you have to pay for and live in Cardiff to take. Um, this is the first MOOC we've done. The content's going to stay up there, and obviously we'll be looking at, at possibly rerunning this and updating it in due course. Um, uh, someone, editor, uh, is asking whether the Centre for Community Journalism here at Cardiff is going to uh, consider setting up some kind of forum for peer and other support for existing hyperlocals. We have one. Uh, go to communityjournalism.co.uk and register on the site there, and that is a network that we are setting up and establishing for community journalists and hyperlocals everywhere, and we'll help to offer resources and links and support, uh, and hopefully some, some peer support through that as well. So communityjournalism.co.uk, if you register there, um, hopefully that will uh, provide you with some, some extra um, uh, resources. Uh, Marion Fleischman is asking, uh, Dave, story full, S-T-O-R-Y-F-U-L dot com. Is it dot com, Dave, I think? I think so. Just Google Storyful, you'll find it. Storyful, S-T-O-R-Y-F-U-L. And then Moses, again, was asking, going back to Community Radio, Dave, he's asking whether you need any any wave, wavelengths or bandwidths in order to be able to operate Community Radio. Now, obviously, you talked about doing it free, digitally through the web. I, I guess in most countries, if you want to do it through the airwaves, you're going to need a license, aren't you? Yes. And um, that, that, that in many countries could prove difficult and time consuming. And so uh, the easy way is to start online. And, and of course, by starting online, you, you start to learn, you build your audience so that when the day comes and you can become uh, a proper radio station, then you, you can uh, do it properly. So if you take the example of West Africa Democracy Radio, they're using free software produced by guys in the Czech Republic called um, uh, Source Fabric. They've got a software called um, Airtime, which is a complete radio playout system, which is free to download, works with the free content management, management system called New Scoop with free templates. And these guys are up and running an in inter internet radio system. Now, you know, when things change in the territory and they can get uh, transmission and they can get a license, then they've already got the team, they're producing content, they're well re rehearsed and practiced. The thing is not to wait for that. That's going to take a lot of time in some territories. So the, the thing is, I think, just to go out and... You know, I, 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 every time I go on a trip, I buy one of these little Zoom mics, which is broadcast quality, and I take it out, and, and usually they snap my hand up and say, oh, please leave it, and then um, they're, they're, they're broadcasting. One Zoom mic in one little community with... Um, a set of separate uh, cards, SD cards, the Zoom mic never needs to stop. It comes back to the studio, you put a new card in, someone else and goes out and finds another story. I think the other thing to say is, uh, you were asking a question about the license. I think sometime during this discussion we should touch on expectations of how much content you can produce that's credible. Um, so for a radio station, you know, it may be just one story a day one story a day that you put up on SoundCloud and start to share on a Facebook page, you are still doing radio, it's just that it's not rolling, it's just that it's not based in the usual pattern. But just work out what's a sustainable amount of content you can deliver regularly and start doing that online before you start worrying about um, licenses and transmitters. Yeah, that's great. Dave, perhaps you, we could put those links to the, that internet radio resources you were talking about, we could put those up on the site if you could um, let, us, let us have them later. That would be really helpful. Um, now, there's a question on Twitter from uh, Flip F, I think it, it is. Uh, if anyone with a passion for journalism can be a journalist, is there a danger of degradation of the profession? Now, this is a, something that's come up right through this course, really, and it's what's the difference between community journalists, citizen journalists, professional journalists, community journalism, a threat to professional journalism, or how does it work? So I, I <laughs> go a couple of times at, at answering it, but... Um, Let's start briefly with Glyn, and then I'll come back to you, Dave. Glyn, what, what's your view on all of this? Uh, I don't think it's a threat. I think one of the things about professional newsrooms, for want of a better way of putting it, is that pe there are they're smaller teams. You know, people think, oh, the local newspaper, the local TV radio station, they cover everything. They can cover a certain amount. And what's been happening, certainly um, with the BBC in the Midlands, is that they've been partnering with some of the hyperlocals to actually increase their offer. If you've got one person covering their own village, covering their own part of a town, covering their own street, they'll be able to get the story day by day that journalists based in the big news industry wouldn't get. So I think the interesting thing for me is 
going to be the development of proper partnerships. Um, to my understanding, the Daily Post up in North Wales has been working with Wrexham.com, um, a hyperlocal based in in Welsh city of, of Wrexham. So, I mean, I think I don't see it as a threat. I see it as an opportunity for partnership and something that would strengthen both. I mean, the ideal thing for me on that kind of approach would be skill shares. You know, the hyperlocals can benefit from skill sharing if if the media do it properly. Um, citizen journalists, I think that's. I think it's a really interesting phrase, and I've been to loads of journalism conferences where people have sort of spent hours debating: Is there such a thing? Are we talking about citizens who witness things? So are they citizen witnesses? I don't care. These are people who are seeing things, snapping it, recording it, tweeting it, sharing it, and whatever. They are on the ground. They are seeing what's happening around them. And, you know, they're an advantage to hyperlocalists every bit as much as they are to mainstream news. But to me, it's got to be about partnerships. Okay. David, your view on, on community journalism and professional journalism, how does it all fit together? Yeah, well, uh, like you, Richard, I've probably um, gone into BBC newsrooms and seen people without an idea. You know, people who come in and do a nine-to-five shift to look at the computer for the wires to see what's happening, who flick through the papers looking for a story idea from page 35 of the Financial Times. Um, and then you see bloggers who are blogging 24 hours a day with a passion, with a knowledge about finance, about the environment, about uh, politics. And you can see sometimes... Which is the journalist? You wonder which is the journalist, the one that qualified and did a nine-to-five job or the one that's finding stories and, and delivering them with a passion. And I did some work recently in the CIS, the, you know, the former Soviet Union, the Commonwealth of Independent States, and I did some training. And it was with a group that came from Global Voices, which is like an aggregator for all the, all the bloggers who've actually got um, followers. And some of the bloggers out there in the CIS and the Caucasus have more followers and have more of an audience than some of the mainstream media. And the mainstream media got lazy. The mainstream media thought it was quite easy. We could turn up and do what we did every day. We're the journalists. We know best. And the bloggers start to come up with stories that they weren't covering. And there was something unique and fresh and lively and focused about it. And over the time, I think the mainstream media did get lazy, and I think we've hidden behind all of this. I think anyone is a journalist who finds a story and applies editorial values to it. I think the big issue is what's the difference between an activist and a journalist? Now, there's some bloggers who are clearly activists for one line or the other. That's fine. That's fine. But a journalist has to offer all sides of a story. We have to be objective, impartial, fair, and accurate. We have to have standards because we have an audience to, to talk to. And that's the difference between journalism. And I think if we can find so-called citizen journalists who are applying some sort of editorial integrity to their content and are working with a passion on topics that they're knowledgeable, with contacts that they've found that no one else is um, talking to, then we have journalists, whatever you want to call them. Great. Now, let's pick up a few more questions. Um, we're just about halfway through now. And uh, if you've just joined us, the, the viewers have been growing. So I'm Richard Sandbrook, I'm with Lynn Motter's head, a colleague here at Cardiff, and with uh, David Brewer, who is a media strategy consultant, someone who's very experienced in terms of working with independent media around the world. Um, there's a question here, is there a central organisation where press releases are collected for journalists to follow up on regarding events, etc., in the UK? Um, if you want to send in a press release to get attention for an event, in the Press Association, which is the national news agency is the obvious place to send it. And in terms of, as a hyper-local wanted to, to subscribe, Press Association is very expensive. There are kind of forward planning services, but you have to subscribe to them, and the cost will obviously be there. I think the thing I would suggest, I'll just check what the other two think in a moment, would be to say, what are the issues that are relevant to your site, to your community, to your service, and can you find organizations that are um, uh, you know, working in those areas and on those issues, and be at the local council, whatever it may be, and you can subscribe to their feeds and, and their, uh, their uh, online internet RSS feeds and other email feeds, and maybe get them that way for free. But obviously, you have to do that organization by organization, and you have to think through what's going to be relevant to you in your site. So it's a question of which direction you're thinking in. If you're trying to get attention to uh, what's happening in your area, then send a press, press release to the Press Association, I'd say, or obviously to local media. But if you're trying to get information back the other way, it's either expensive because you have to subscribe to a service, or else just think about what are the issues you want to know about and find the organizations and subscribe to them either through a, 
an online internet feed, RSS feed, or, or email subscription. But uh, Glenn or Dave, any thoughts on that? I'd just say that press releases really, if, if I had a newsroom where a journalist, um, an editor handed out a press release to a journalist, it would probably mean that both the editor and the journalist have failed in their job because it's the last resort. You know, you should have journalists coming in with stories that they're falling over themselves to tell and editors who are making sure that every time they have a news meeting they have that fresh story that's coming in. Um, you have to remember that it's different, isn't it? If you're a one, if you're a one person hyper-local or community site and you need to find out what's going on out there but it's just you, then yeah. how do you get information? So, you know, you, you find the sites that you want to follow, you look at what they're putting out, you look at the, the main industries in the area and you see what they're putting out, remembering in all times that the press release will not tell the whole story and that maybe it's the fourth paragraph you need to be looking at. Maybe the top line is what they want to tell you. Press releases are put out by businesses, governments and police authorities to tell you what they want you to cover um, and that's fair enough, that's the way the system works but the journalist should never ever just take a press release and run it and I think uh, it locally for example when I started this little website Brooklyn's Park where I live um, all those years ago when we launched the, the BBC's website uh, people started to send in press releases to me, email me press releases and I looked at these and I thought they expect these to go online in this state. You know, it, it, it didn't even read, it didn't, there was nothing in it that was of any value at all and so I think the community uh, journalist has to still apply the same editorial rigor to uh, even more so to a press release but the thing is if you are in a community and you want to try to find a source of news which is what you're talking about look at the Twitter hat hashtags used for your area set up a um, a dashboard using Hootsuite or TweetDeck. Set up columns around the keywords that he used in your area, the key businesses, the names of the politicians, the names of uh, all, you know, the, the local station, the names of anything, and start to monitor them on a daily basis. Then you'll find the stories. In our area, the Well in Hatfield Times puts out all its news releases on the uh, on Twitter and so do all the businesses so you can just sit at home and you can just start to be your own orchestrator of this uh, new service you're going to build by just looking at what they're putting out on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Plus and all the other social media. Twitter is more and more becoming a, a, a kind of must, must go to service for information in that way so absolutely mm -hmm. right. Uh, picking up a couple of other questions, uh, Yulia asked whether the content of this course will be available after it's finished. Yes it's going gonna, it's gonna to remain up and remain open so you can Go back and go over those, uh, those modules again at your leisure. Um, Steve Appleby is asking whether there's another way of making a bit of money. Would we recommend something like Shutterstock, sharing photos we've taken, the pieces we've written? Um, uh, uh, yeah, why not? I mean, the, the more and more agencies, Demotics is another one I know, but there are agencies that will take pictures and citizen journalism pictures um, and try and market them for you. So I don't see a downside if you're prepared to uh, to sell them in, in that way. And uh, they're prepared to take them. So, uh, yeah, there are a number of agencies. I don't know, Glenn or Dave, whether you can think of any others. He's mentioned Shutterstock. I know of Demotics. And any others you can think of? There's a whole raft of them out there who are trying to uh, help you sell your content because they get a cut. So, you know, there's a big business in citizen journalism, and they're, they're desperate for your content that they can... Um, uh, sort of produce for the customers that they're connected to. So you need each other at this moment and um, you know one, one way around this, a really good way of trying to get a bit of money I think if you're a, a photographer is open a Flickr account, set up as I said before your, your brand name, um, put a little bio, link to your uh, Twitter feed, your Facebook page or whatever you've built or your blog and then you start to take some pictures, some really good pictures. Offer two or three free of charge under Creative Commons. Make sure that you tag them properly, that they're Creative Commons, that anyone can use them, download them, uh, they can adapt them, they can make money out of them as long as they give you attribution. However, have alongside those two or three pictures you give free of charge, 20 or so that are high quality, that people um, will can still click on, but they're copyright. And to use it, they have to pay you and you can then start um, teasing people into a business around your photography based on giving away one or two examples of the fine work you're doing. Can we just pick up on that briefly because there are a couple of other questions related to copyright. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in now so that we'll try and, try and keep things tight. Nigel Howarth just asked what can you do about other publishers taking your stories and publishing them? 
Uh, someone else has asked about copyright. If you do an, inter an interview, is the copyright with the interviewee or the interviewer? And there's some questions about reusing material from uh, other organizations. Now, obviously, if it's another um, commercial media organization, you can't reuse their material without probably um, uh, trespassing their copyright, as it were, unless they make it openly available. Uh, and some of them do make their, their clips openly available or less for marketing purposes through social media or whatever. But using another commercial company material is difficult. Um, what about what can you do if somebody nicks your story? Not much unless you've got a lot of money to hire a very expensive solicitor to take them on. And the solicitor probably would do that because it's, it's going to be a lifetime of income because you'll never catch them. Uh, I think there are ways to do it, but I think uh, you know there's watermarking, there's all sorts of clever technical sides to this, but you know, once it's out in the digital world, you've really, uh, you know, you've potentially lost it. The, the cr clever way to do it, I think, is to see uh, the, your content going further afield as a distribution strategy. So some of the main media houses now, and I, I release all my material under Creative Commons so that people can embed it and use it in their own blogs uh, because that links back to your own material. And some of the major media houses, I think Al Jazeera went down this road with some of its assets, is saying, hey, use it, and put it in your blogs, make them look pretty. As long as it links back to us, it brings traffic back to us, uh, and it increases their traffic flow. So I think, what, I, what, I think what you can do is just ask whoever's nicked your story. Can you, you know, can you at least put a link back to my yeah. site? Yeah. And then you get the traffic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, about, what about when you do an interview? Who owns the copyright to an interview? If you are, if you talk to your, you know, somebody in your community, um, uh, community leader or whatever, and do an interview with them, whose copyright is that interview? Well, the copyright actually exists within the created work. So, I mean, technically, the copyright is owned by the creator, so that, that's the site that does it. Mm -hmm. The issue then will depend in, in various kind of regions around the world around sort of rights to publish and, and kind of, yeah. you know, this is why when BBC and the, the big, you know, some of the big global media broadcasters will use release forms and mm -hmm. actually get people's permission. It's not that they own the copyright to it, but they, you know, it, it requires permission to broadcast. Yeah. So I think, you know, there, there's that. Just think about that and get, you know, just make very transparent and clear what you're trying to do and why. I mean, there are services where you, depending on where your stuff ends up, you can actually log on to various places and ask for things to be taken down. But I agree with David completely. You know, if somebody's used your stuff, and the, your details aren't on it, just say, give me a shout, just say, look, I don't mind you using it. Just give me a link. Absolutely. I think um, it's slightly related to this, and Richard, it's a slightly different issue, but it's related. Um, it's what Glenn was talking about. Make people aware what you're doing. You could go out and do an interview and, and say, look, this is going to go on my site. I'm going to put this in a blog. This is going to go global. You're going to be seen in another country. I have seen this... Um, happen with people not being made aware and it can be very dangerous especially with XL media who are being trained out of country in a safe place uh, and uh, interview people about a, a point which is suddenly seen in their home country and it's surprising you know it, it'll probably stun most people but some people don't realize that that little bit of video that they're doing with you in the street could go global and be seen by people at home uh -huh. and it can, you know, there's a danger, there's a, a protection element here. You need to just make sure people are aware. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, now, I've got a couple of other questions. Uh, Glenn, I think this one's for you. Deborah uh, Jezunami is having problems with WordPress on WAMP server because I use my WordPress directly online, but I'm interested in using my WordPress offline with the WAMP server. How mm -hmm. can you help? <laughs> The key thing to check is that there'll be a folder. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head with WAMP, so if if I'm slightly wrong, I do apologise. But there'll be a folder called something like HT Docs. When you look at the kind of the the manual for whatever server it is, there's a small folder, and that's essentially the folder for the web server. So you you go to WordPress.org, you download the WordPress package. You get that onto your computer, you unzip it, you then take the folder that you've unzipped and drop it in HT Docs, and then you start the process as per the video with launching the server, setting up the database, and doing a WordPress install. Okay, um, uh, if that doesn't uh, work... I can put some links up later, that's fine. 
put some links under under this part of the uh, the, the the site that hopefully will help. Now, um, P. D'Angelo says, um, can we talk about how much to put on the front page? Some of the sites we've looked at seem quite cluttered, yet they're very successful. How do you strike a balance? Uh, I don't know, uh, Glenn, have you got a view on that? You, you, you've done layout, you've done... <laughs> um, I'm quite a minimalist, personally. Um, I like things to be simple. I mean, I think the, the key thing to think about is your site is your shop window. And if you are trying to sell too much at once, you can make it difficult to find people. But we've all been in stores which are absolutely rammed. They're like in a kind of a cave of wonders which are full of fabulous things that you enjoy spending time discovering. Both things work well with great content. If you've got the great news stories, if you've got good interviews, if you understand who you are writing for or recording, you know, broadcasting for, it, the site becomes kind of secondary in a way. I mean, you know, I could say, yes, you've got to have a site that can collapse down so people can see it on their smartphone or, or whatever. That's all lovely and it will help, but you've got to have the good journalism at the base, otherwise it's a, it's a waste of time. Okay. Uh, now we've had a, a question here about older audiences and how do you? Um, it's two related questions in a way. Somebody's saying we talk a lot about younger audiences and the digital audience tends to be younger. But what about the over fifties and how do you how do you attract an audience of the over fifties? And I suppose in the end it all comes back to say if that's the community you're focused on, you just produce content that's relevant and of interest to them and hope to hope to build it up. Uh, any other thoughts? How do you how do you engage an older audience? I think the main thing is, as you say, Richard, identify who your target audience is. And you know, the model in the West is we look at the nine or ten audience segments in a, uh, an area and you pick the one or two you're going to super serve and give them a really good service and that might be the older generation, it might be the younger generation. And then you sit down and you look at the issues that affect them most in their lives and it'll be something like health, it'll probably be something like um, finance, homes, it'll do with security, keeping warm, maybe, I don't know, it'll do with holidays, spending money that mass, uh, amassed over the years. But you work out the issues that affect them most, and then you come up with an, an, an editorial proposition that addresses those issues. You take on to dig around those issues, not based on press releases or what people are saying in the local council, but based on looking at the issue, what about hospital waiting lists? Are the, are the hospital waiting lists? How they, do they compare with the next town? Go to the next town, get the stats, find the stats, do a story, say, oh, our town is um, 10 years behind the next town in hospital waiting list. You know, we, we are 20th on the, the ladder. And start to dig around stories. Stories are not um, always breaking, developing news. Stories about journalists looking at the issues that affect their target audience, such as your older audience here, and finding out what really worries them, what keeps them awake at night, and then using your journalistic nous to go and dig around those stories and come up with statistics and facts and quotes that make those stories live, and hopefully, once you start to get voices around them, bring some traction to bring change, because that and ultimately is what journalists should be doing. We should be informing the public debate so the audience and those who are representing them make educated choices. You know, fundamentally, that's what we're doing. So you can look at your older audience, but you just have to then make sure that you're not patronizing any audience, old or young, but that you really look at the issues that concern them and take them on on their behalf. They cannot knock on doors or pick up the phone and talk to the powerful. You can, as a community journalist, say, I am doing this on behalf of these people. Please give me an answer. Good. And, and, and any thoughts? Is there a technology issue as well? People often say, oh, you know, old, older people are a bit, a bit more hesitant with the technology, but actually, I think we talk about silver surface. I'm not sure that's true. Is it? It's just getting comfortable with it. No, I mean a lot of the research that's coming out of the states and the UK certainly says that. Um, well, I'm going to say more mature people because my my parents would kill me if I said uh, older people. But I, so I can say it. Yeah, that's all right. A little bit of a way off yet. Um, tablets. A lot of people are using tablets. I mean, a few years back, my mum said she wanted a laptop. She's not very savvy with computers. And in the end, we sort of uh, let her play around with a couple of different types of tablet. She surfs the web all the time now. So, you know, this is potentially where something that does, a site that does collapse might come in useful. But, I mean, the other thing is, in the UK, there's an organisation called Saga, which is an organisation for more mature people, and it does everything from kind of 
insurance through to lifestyle magazines. He's got his own website. Small print products, you know, that's, it's not an exclusive thing, but it's something to consider. But I wouldn't kind of say people aren't online. Not all older people are online for sure. So again, it comes back to what David was saying earlier. Know okay. your market. Exactly. Know your market. Related, yeah, related to that, there have been a couple more questions asking about how do you build an audience? How do you get an audience to find you? Um, now, we have covered this in earlier weeks, but let's just get, get some views again at this stage. If you've launched a, launched a site, you think you know what you're trying to do and who you're trying to reach, how do you get them to find you, and how do you build that audience? Dave, have you got any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, there's several ways. The old-fashioned way is to set up a couple of local focus groups. Um, this is how we would have done it on my very first newspaper. Uh, so you come up with a new idea, and you have a focus group, and you get people in, and you uh, talk about what you're doing, and you get some real feedback, which then gets around. It gets around the community starts to talk about it because you've involved them from that level. More recently, it's very easy now because you just um, start to look at the Facebook pages, you look at the Twitter feeds, you start to look at LinkedIn, you start to look at what exists in your community and you join those groups and then you have to be proactive. So every media house needs to have a social media strategy. It's no use writing a lovely blog and sitting back and looking at it with no one visiting it. And social media is that free tool which gives us the chance to um, publicize and to show off and to celebrate and brag about our content. But it's more than that. We must send out tweets and we must send out Facebook invitations that are a compelling reason to click and return and to visit. They can't be just, hey, look at me, I'm great, I've got this story. We need to ask questions, we need to engage, we need to bring people in, we need to make them feel it's part of it. So the successful social media strategy is bolted on to what's being produced in a way to try and get it out to the audience and get the audience to feedback so we can continue to build. Once you do that, once you get that 360 degree journey going, you'll start to get a rhythm and a, a momentum and then the audience will come, but not if you just write the stuff and hope someone will pick it up. Great. Now, we've just got a, a few minutes left. Building up from that, Stephen Reid asked on the site, at what point does a community journalism or hyperlocal outlet move from an exciting, romantic, fun local news and information venture with the community at its core to a competitive or replacement commercial regional news service with business and sales and profits? How, what's the growth curve for hyper-locals and community sites. I mean, I suppose I start off by saying not everybody wants to move up that curve. Some people want to stay at one end of it just doing, you know, a good small job for their local community. But there are others who, and we've had case studies during this course, who do absolutely move up that curve to become fully-fledged commercial businesses. I think I, that's a, it's a tough one to answer because, as you say, it's kind of, it's based on the first imponderable. Once you get going, what do you want to do? You know, there's loads of great sites that are done by people who just care about the communities, whatever kind of community that is, whether it's a community of interest or a, a local community. It depends on time factors. What can you do? You know, you've got to pay the bills somehow. So while you're building a business, you know, we, we all know people who've kind of built their own businesses from scratch. It's a lot of graft and a lot of hard work and putting that time in. So I think the question for me on that one is kind of a bit of a throwback, actually. It's how much effort and time do you want to put into it to make it a commercial success and a challenge to the mainstream media? We, we have seen examples where this has worked brilliantly. We've seen ones where people have kind of got it okay, but then they start having cash flow problems. And we've seen examples where people are just perfectly content once, twice a week covering what needs covering in their area. Good, okay. Um, uh, Dave, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think if you know from the outset what you're doing it for, if you think I, I'm doing this because I care about the community and I don't want to be rich, it's a bit of a hobby, it's a bit of a side interest, um, then you can leave it at that level. On the bigger level, on many of the media houses I've been working with over the years, as soon as you become profitable, then people start to hover around and want to bite a, a bite of that business. They either want to bite it off you or they want to have a share of it. And so based on your success and the figures that you release, you will then grow the interest. But I think with community, the one I've I run in my local village. It's been going now since 1998, and it's it's running itself. 
I, I stopped doing news stories about 2009 because I was too busy, and I let a forum called SMF Simple Machines take over, and the community writes the stories now, and I have a team of 12 volunteer moderators who look at the stories, and if anything's wrong, they take it down while we discuss it, and it runs itself. And the front page is taking a feed of the headlines from the forum, so anyone could be posting now in the last hour while I've been on, and the three front page lead stories will have changed because the forum takes over. Now, that is really community content by the community for the community, and that will probably never change. That will just stay there, and it's a really good. It's the old parish pump. It's the old way of doing it, and I think that that's worth preserving to some level. Okay, great. Now we're getting more or less to the, the last question or so. That, there was one question on verification here. Um, I can't remember who it was from, but all I'd say is I think we did cover that in the course. I would go back and look at the Claire Wardle video in particular, but we, we gave some good tips on the importance of verification and how to, how to go about verification. Uh, there's a question on Twitter from Kelly Quigley Hicks, which kind of circles around on something we talked about at the beginning of this Hangout, and we just talked about older um, or, or more mature, as Glenn would put it, um, uh, audience and readers and so on as well, but she says for rural areas with poor broadband and older communities, how can you engage them? Should you be thinking of print rather than online? And any thoughts? Yes, I think she's probably right in some areas, but how do you get the print to the to the people that you want to reach? Um, and increasingly, I'm finding in the village I've been, I work, I live in, um, some of the some of those people posting are increasingly of the older generation. So I, I don't think that. Um, I, I don't think it's as big an issue as we think. Well, what you're talking about maybe is the people who are not able to keep up with the news because they aren't in, connected. And I think you're right. Um, maybe a newsletter shoved through the door is, is the best way to do that. But obviously that's going to, even if you're just photocopying it, it's going to cost, cost. more. But, um, but you know, broadband and connectivity is improving all the time. Glenn, did you want to come in? Yeah, just to pick up on that. I mean, this is kind of, to me, this is where if you start in, this is about as David said, super serving parts of your community. Once you can actually engage with some people, and if you're doing sponsorship, if you're doing ads, you can then start to put some money into that kind of a second, you know, second service. Um, the Caffili Observer, which is a hyper local here in South Wales, as an example, they actually use, um, if I remember rightly, the Newspaper Club, which is a print-on-demand service to create a print newspaper as well as, you know, they run the site, they'll post first on the site, and they'll create a print newspaper. So it is, you know, you can do everything from just print something out on your own printer right through to kind of having somebody print a newspaper for you, but it's down to costs as well and your skill set and time. And that's really why we, we concentrate on the digital opportunity here because it is, you know, very low or, or, or zero cost. Yeah. Okay, look, we're just about out out of time. Um, thank you very much to, to, to Glyn and Dave. Let me just say, in answer to a couple of questions, all of the content of this MOOC is going to stay up and stay open, so you can, if you've registered on the site, you can go through it uh, at your leisure and um, uh, you know, continue to tune up your skills. I'm afraid there won't be certificates of achievement of this course, though we'll consider that if we kind of run it formally again in the future. Um, I would encourage you to go to communityjournalism.co.uk and register there to become part of the network because there'll be ongoing support and resources and links and things that you can use there if you're interested. And I'd also recommend Dave's site, which I'll ask him to uh, to give the URL for in a minute on Media Helping Media because again, there's some um, we have a link to it elsewhere in the course, but there's some fantastic resources uh, and advice there um, as well. So Dave, thank you very much for joining us. It's been fantastic to have you. Uh, we'll listen to answering questions uh, online as well. So what, what's the website and what should people be looking at? MediaHelpingMedia.org and it's all free to download, it's all under Creative Commons. Click on the training link from basics through to advanced and ethics and so on. It's all there. You can use it, translate it, do what you like with it. Brilliant and uh, highly recommended. So uh, MediaHelpingMedia.org, communityjournalism.co.uk. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed doing the course. We're pretty much at the end of it. This is the last week. We very much enjoyed working uh, with all of you, and um, uh, I hope you see it through to that final final quiz at the end to make sure you've learned everything. But uh, Glyn and Dave, thank you very much indeed, and uh, I'm about to press off. So thanks very much. Good luck. Thank you. Bye.